This service is going to challenge some people in a lot of ways this morning. They've already challenged us musically, but will challenge us in other ways too. America is a deeply polarized country. I, I, I set them up to that. <laughs> to live in America, no it's not. To live in America at this moment is to live in a polarized country. Americans increasingly separate themselves along political lines. This polarization is evident in how Americans vote. The number of Americans who vote straight ticket, who vote exclusively for members of a single political party, is the largest it's been in generations. This polarization is evident in where Americans get our news. Liberals and conservatives watch different television news programs, read different newspapers, listen to different radio stations, and get information from different websites. This polarization is even present in how Americans eat. In 2012, Barack Obama won 77% of the counties where you can find a Whole Foods. <laughs> True but only 29% of counties where you can find a Cracker Barrel. <laughs> it's present in where we live. In 1976, only a quarter of Americans lived in landslide counties. That's counties where there was a 60-40 split or greater in how people voted for president. Now, more than half of all Americans live in such a county. And if you live in Orange County, or Durham County, you're part of that majority. This polarization is even present in who we love. In 1960, only 4% of Democrats and 5% of Republicans said they would be disappointed if their child married someone of the other political party. Today, more than a third of Democrats and more than half of all Republicans say they would be disappointed if their child married someone of the other party. Political scientists who've studied this phenomenon conclude that this separation contributes to radicalization. It helps extremism to thrive. And it also adds to incivility. As one member of Congress put it, this is not a collegial body anymore. It is more like gang behavior. Members walk into the chamber full of hatred each day. And so I ask you, is this polarization a problem? I'm going to answer maybe, or maybe not. Maybe it's a source of gridlock and destructive strife. Or maybe it is a necessary clarification of two distinct visions for the country that cannot and ought not be reconciled. That's the context. So come, let us be challenged. Let us be open. Let us be wise. Let us worship together. Last month, my friend and my colleague, Reverend Mark Stringer, returned to the pulpit following a six-month sabbatical. Mark is beginning his 16th year serving the First Unitarian Church in Des Moines, Iowa. During his ministry there, that, that congregation has more than doubled in size. And Mark has distinguished himself um, throughout our denomination for being uh, thought of as an, as an excellent minister, and I concur. And what I'd like to do is I would like to read to you for our reading today an excerpt from his sermon last month. He writes, There was a time earlier in my ministry when I might have offered you a sermon on a Sunday like this, to suggest that the solution to what ails us would be to simply listen more to each other, especially to those with whom we disagree, and even to those we're mostly convinced are idiots. And that's probably good advice, and ultimately needed to a point. And you shouldn't be surprised if I preach a sermon like that sometime soon. However, while I was on sabbatical, I couldn't find the words for that message and I still can't this morning. I can't ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself, and the truth is that I don't want to listen to some of the things people are saying right now. I don't want to listen to those who think that building an expensive border wall between the United States and Mexico will do anything useful for anyone, except maybe for fence contractors. 
I don't want to listen to those who claim, who claim that Mexican refugees are any more morally deficient or inherently dangerous than anyone else in this country. I don't want to listen to those who make broad stroke assessments of Islam as being any more fundamentally, fundamentally violent or worthy of suspicion than Christianity or any other major world religion for that matter. I don't want to listen to those who want to stoke and play upon fears of terrorism in this country when facts reveal that since the attacks of September 11th, Americans have been no more likely to die at the hands of terrorists than by being crushed to death by unstable televisions. <laughs> I don't want to listen to those who are so caught up in dismissals of systemic racism that they think trumpeting all lives matter or blue lives matter is a necessary or helpful counterpoint to black lives matter, as if those of us giving voice to the inequities experienced by black people in this country are somehow denying that everyone else matters too. I don't want to listen to those who reject the tsunami of scientific opinion that climate change is real, impacted by human behavior, and poses a significant threat to the planet and life as we know it. I don't want to listen to those proclaiming that we need to make America great again, even as they cannot successfully point to an era that is for any other humans than a few rich white males any better than the era we're living in now. And I don't want to listen to those trying to scare gun owners into thinking that any elected officials are truly threatening to repeal the Second Amendment. And I don't want to listen to those who can't get past their assumptions that Hillary Clinton is a criminal, despite literally hundreds of millions of dollars being devoted to a witch hunt against her over the past three decades with no criminal wrongdoing proven whatsoever. I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen, I can't listen, and I am sick and tired of listening. Thus ends the reading. <laughs> so last month in Durham, I went to a meeting of Triangle Surge. Surge stands for Showing Up for Racial Justice, and it's an organization for white allies committed to challenging racism by calling white people, all their white people, into the work of, of anti-racism. And at that meeting, we received training in a skill known as deep canvassing, deep canvassing. Ordinary canvassing involves going around and getting people to listen to a 30-second spiel, a 30-second soundbite about your issue and, and, and how they ought to respond to it. But deep canvassing is different. It involves a more in-depth conversation, perhaps 10 minutes, where most of the time is spent listening to the other person's perspective. And you kind of make your appeal within the context of having listened deeply to them. And so at that training, we watched a video of deep canvassing in action. This was a, a video of an actual encounter on someone's doorstep. It was, the video was from uh, 2012 in Minnesota when organizers used deep canvassing door to door and by phone to successfully challenge an anti-same-sex marriage ballot initiative. Deep canvassing, deep canvassing was credited with playing an important role in Minnesota being the first state ever to reject a ballot initiative restricting marriage equality. And in the video, documenting a real interaction, a young woman in her 20s knocks on the door, and a middle-aged man answers. She asks him, how does he intend to vote? Is he 100% against the ballot initiative? Is he 100% supportive? Is he somewhere in the middle? And the man answers and tells her he's undecided. Right now, he's 50-50. He's he could go either way. So she asks him, why might you be supportive? Why might you, why might you vote no on this, on this initiative? Why might you vote against this ban? And he, being a typical Minnesotan, talks about his recreational hockey league that he belongs to and how he has a gay teammate and how he doesn't want to, to hurt that teammate by, by voting in a way that would, would take away rights from, from that person who he's in community with. And all that time, the, the canvasser is there, and she just listens deeply and attentively. 
And then she asks him about why he might not be supportive of equal marriage. And he talks about his upbringing as an observant Catholic. And she listens to him just as intently, just as deeply. Then she shares her own reasons for being pro-marriage equality. And at the end of the conversation, she asks him which way he's leaning. And he tells her he will probably vote against this ballot initiative. He probably will vote against it. That's the power of listening. The power of listening. And so all across the country, local chapters of of showing up for racial justice are exploring whether this deep canvassing technique might be useful in helping other white people to be concerned about systemic racism in our country. Can these conversations, these dialogues, help folks here in the triangle to be more aware of, more concerned about the racist policies from our governor and legislature, racism in our police and court system, in our education system, in our immigration system. People who've studied deep canvassing, who've studied this, conclude that listening is an effective strategy for promoting not only short-term change, but also long-term changes in people's attitudes. People who've studied it show that a a kind of a 30-second interaction may get somebody to change the way they vote tomorrow or may not, but that 10-minute conversation will not only be more likely to change the way they vote tomorrow, but it will actually have an effect six months or a year, that people will, will hold those views and continue to hold them more effectively. Isn't that interesting? Listening. So listening is powerful is powerful. This morning my sermon is about listening. It's about the role that listening plays in healing our world, in building a better, fairer, and more just world. As liberals, we tend to hold out hope that listening is important for building community and for healing the divisions that separate us. We tend to see dialogue and conversation as good and as needed and as constructive. We get excited about a dialogue. So following the Sandy Hook massacre, President Obama called for, quote, a national conversation on gun control. National conversation. Following the killings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile and police officers in Dallas and Baton Rouge, President Obama hosted a, a, quote, national conversation on race in America. My colleague, Mark Stringer, even goes as far as to articulate a theology of listening. He writes in the affirmative, I've spent more than 15 years now telling you about my theology of creative interchange, the idea that the divine is made real in the world through the open-hearted engagement we have with others, communication with the expectation that we could have our own ideas changed by the encounter, Without being open to difference and a prioritizing of curiosity over certainty, I've preached we run the risk of becoming stuck in our own perspectives and the possibilities for necessary shifts. And the the possibilities for necessary shifts in our views become limited, if not impossible. Does that sound like your faith at all? How many of you kind of believe that? Believe that about listening? Earlier this summer, I read with great interest a piece by the brilliant author George Saunders that was published in The New Yorker. In the piece, he talks about traveling around the country and attending numerous uh, Donald Trump rallies. His journalistic project, he says, is to better understand, maybe even humanize, Trump supporters. And he recalls several conversations with Trump supporters on the subject of immigration, and he talks about how those conversations really quickly went into sort of shouting sound bites. But then he talks about what happens if he tries a different approach, if he humanizes the debate by telling a story, a specific story, a story maybe about a three-year-old girl caught up in our immigration system, maybe a story about his own hardworking neighbors, immigrants who have really blessed the community in which they live. And here is what Saunders writes. In the face of specificity, in the face of story, my interviewees began trying, really trying to think of what would be fairest and most humane for this real person we had imaginatively conjured up. It wasn't that we suddenly agreed, but the tone changed. 
we popped briefly out of zinger mode and began to have some faith in one another, a shared confidence that if we talked long enough, respectfully enough, a solution could be found that might satisfy our respective best notions of who we are. Isn't that lovely? It might satisfy our respective best notions of who we are. And then he begins his next paragraph, well, let's not get too dreamy about it. (laughs) He goes on to talk to this person with whom he had this, this deep, then turned around and began shouting at someone else. I have to confess to you that I myself am conflicted on the issue of dialogue and listening. On the one hand, I want, I deeply want this to be the case. Open-minded creative interchange sounds good to me. But on the other hand, I find myself questioning my commitment to it. Let me explain. A number of years back in church, I put together a panel discussion to discuss environmental issues at the church on a weekday evening. It was a a panel to talk about uh, environmental issues, and I I contacted some great representatives, some scientists, and some representatives of some environmental nonprofits to come and, and speak. And then a member of my church challenged me. She asked, so did you invite any climate change deniers to sit on the panel? No, I didn't, I replied. I don't think they have anything worthwhile to contribute to the discussion. It was a flippant answer, but it was an honest one. Just like Mark Stringer says, I don't want to listen to those who reject the tsunami of scientific opinion that climate change is real, impacted by human behavior, and poses a significant threat to the planet and life as we know it. Just as I would never tell our eco-committee, you need to be more balanced Could you find some pro-fracking members? Could you get some members who want to take down our solar panels? How would that that work? Oh, we should do a a church carpool program. Why? There's no need for that. In the interest of balance, I'd never invite a segregationist to speak in the pulpit as a counterpoint to my position of racial justice. I'd never suggest that we expose our youth to diversity by taking them to a meeting of white supremacists, which is to say educating our youth about the value of diversity does not include exposing them to people who oppose diversity. In our church, we have a group, a Sanctuary for Dialogue group, um, and this group is We're upset about that sanctuary for dialogue. (laughs) Um, In church, we have a sanctuary for dialogue group. And this this group works to host dialogues where people with different different opinions and different viewpoints can can come and talk together. It it holds this idea that that disagreements and tensions can be improved through a dialogue that includes open-minded, open-hearted, active listening. And it seems to me, it seems to me that what they do is really good. And it seems to me, though, that for a dialogue to be successful, there needs to be at least some shared desire that all the participants in the dialogue have to really want something in common, even if what they want in common is to, you know, dislike each other less. That might be as, as, as low bar as you can, but they, but they have to want. They have to want something in common. For a long time uh, in our church, one of the issues that we've had actually a hard time, people in our church have had a hard time talking with each other about is, is Israel and Palestine, that there are people in our church who hold different opinions on that, different viewpoints, different perspectives. And so uh, this fall, the Sanctuary for Dialogue is actually going to try using their model of active, engaged listening to help uh, people who feel differently to talk to each other, just as they have on a whole multiplicity of issues last year and will next year. And I think 
this listening, I actually am optimistic about it because I think that when you get people in the church together, they can actually say this is this is a shared outcome that we want. This is that we can we can agree on something we all want together. That's what I'm optimistic about. But as I researched listening, there's other perspectives on listening that I came across that I want to share with you. Other aspects of listening that have to do with power, with privilege, and with responsibility. And this involves being willing to listen to some things that may not be easy to hear. And I'd like to share with you three or four examples of this listening to what is difficult to hear. The first example comes from an online posting I came across recently. The author of that posting writes, Privileged people have this thing where they believe your best friend in the world can have opposing political ideas. You're supposed to be able to have healthy debate and disagreeing shouldn't harm your friendship. That's gross and stupid. The author continues, it's really easy to say that when your disagreements are all theoretical. It's easy to say when none of the consequences, none of the laws affect your life. It's different, though, for the rest of us. I can't be friends with you if you don't think I should be allowed to vote. We can't be friends if you think my friends shouldn't have the ability to designate whatever gender they want and have that be legally recognized. We can't be friends if you think I don't deserve health care. All these theoretical political ideas and lively debates affect real people. And I won't be friends with someone who disagrees with me on them because disagreement means you don't see me or a whole bunch of my friends and family as human beings worthy of rights. Provocative? Here's another one. At the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly, up until 2006, for decades, up until 2006, it was customary for the uh, opening celebration at General Assembly to begin with a Native American, an invited Native American, giving a blessing and reminding the, the people of you know, the land where this convention center now sits, used to be the land of, of this tribe or that tribe. Until 2006, when General Assembly was held in St. Louis, and uh, the, the people who belonged, the, the Native Americans who belonged to whatever, whatever tribe was in St. Louis, they, had now, they now live on a reservation uh, in the center of Oklahoma. And so the people planning the General Assembly reached out to them and invited elders from this tribe to come give a blessing. They got a terse letter in reply. Excuse me? You want us to drive 500 miles each way in order to speak for two minutes in order to make you feel better about yourselves? What's wrong with you? Interesting response, huh? And last Wednesday, last Wednesday, there was a fascinating editorial piece in the Washington Post uh, by an African-American poet and activist, Zach Lindley, and it was entitled, It's Time to Stop Talking About Racism with White People. And in this article, the author says, white people who truly want to be allies can find their path to allyship without black validation and without us having to take time out of our days to educate you. They can find their own curriculum and figure out for themselves how they can do their part in fighting the good fight, and they can do it without the promise of African-American praise. I'm not about to keep checking to see if they're doing that much because it's not my job and it's not yours either. He goes on to say and concludes, he says, if what I'm talking about means completely disengaging with white America altogether, then so be it. So I want to, each of these three perspectives troubles and upsets in some way an idealized view of listening, dialogue, and conversation. One, one says, I won't be your friend if you hold positions that, that take away my, my selfhood. Another says, it's not my job to come 500 miles to take part in your thing. And another says, another says, I'm not sure I want dialogue. I'm convinced these voices are important voices to hear and to listen to, and each of these three perspectives is paradoxical to the degree that each says, listen to me, I don't want to talk to you. 
listen to me, I don't want to talk to you. That's a voice that's important to hear, too. And so this morning, this is one of those sermons where I'm not going to resolve this tension for you. I'm not going to tell you that one way is right. That's for you to wrestle with. And so I ask you these questions for you to resolve in your own hearts. Does listening save us? If you believe in the power of listening, to what extent does that also include listening to people whose views are deplorable? Or can we only listen, must we only listen, when there is some value, some shared value, some shared vision that we commonly share between us? Are there times when choosing not to engage in conversation is a valid choice? Those answers are for you to find. We had some real lively discussion after the first service. I see they didn't warn many of you away. And as we discern, we'll continue doing our part to build up a better world. Listening? Maybe not.